Understanding Survival, part two. Let's jump right into part two. Go watch part one, otherwise you're gonna be very lost. I hope that you actually did your homework assignment from part one. It was an extremely important homework assignment because when we're talking about survival here, I want you to really understand that we're not talking about theory or philosophy or just cute ideas and it doesn't matter what conclusions you come to about survival or how much you understand it intellectually what really makes the difference between whether this information is going to change your life is if you actually observe it happening in your life you need to do a lot of observation work to be able to understand the things that i'm talking about here otherwise it's just going to go in one ear and out the other so do that homework hopefully you did in which case, let's move in. I have a few other points I want to address here before we properly get into part two. So first of all, a note about part one where I mentioned uh, the, part, the part about squirrels being oak murdering machines. And some people in the comments responded and they say, well, but Leo, squirrels, you know, yeah, of course, squirrels eat a lot of acorns, but also these squirrels, they gather the acorns, they bury them in stashes, and then the squirrels forget about the stashes, and then those oaks grow from those stashes once they, the squirrel forgets about it. So in this sense, the squirrel is not being selfish, but is actually helping the oak trees. And, and yes, that's true. There is an element of that. And one thing that I want to illustrate with this example, actually, it's really good, is that survival can be symbiotic. It's not always the case that when you're engaging in survival activity, you're always only doing something for yourself and never helping anybody else. So in this case, as in the case with many dynamics within nature, within the ecology, between predator and prey and so forth, you see a lot of these kind of semi-symbiotic relationships. But here's the key point that I was making with that squirrel example, is that the squirrel does not know what it's doing. Whether it's being selfish and murdering a bunch of oak trees or helping sometimes to plant a new oak tree by accident, all of it is mechanical and the squirrel has no idea what it's doing. It's just running on autopilot, you see? And that is the key point, and that is exactly what's happening in your life as well. See, in your life, you're not a purely selfish machine that only does stuff to benefit itself and nobody else. No, you of course benefit your family in various ways, you benefit your friends, you benefit your coworkers, you benefit society in various ways. But a lot of times you don't. And so it's a mixed bag. It's a combination of stuff. The key is you're not conscious of what you're doing or how it's happening. And also I want to point out that, remember, ultimately we can't have a duality between selfishness and selflessness. You can't just separate these two as though they're uh, water and oil and they never mix. No, they're, they're constantly mixing. And ultimately when you get to the, to the root of reality, you need to become conscious that really selfishness goes full circle and it becomes selflessness. The highest good that you can do for yourself ultimately becomes the highest good that you can do for others as well, when you realize that self and other are actually one. Now, of course, a lot of people are far from that, but uh, I expect you to be able to, to see that these, these two things are gonna have to come together. Everything's gonna have to come full circle here when you get to, to the rock bottom of it. So keep that in mind. Don't, uh, don't hold that as a duality. Don't hold survival as some sort of uh, duality, as in like survival is bad over here and then selflessness and love is good over here. It's not that simple. It's much more complicated. Also, I wanna point out that unlike animals, humans obfuscate survival. So with animals, it's pretty easy to see how most of the stuff they do is survival. Like you go outside, you look at the birds. What are the birds doing? They're flying around, singing songs, looking for bugs, attracting mates, maybe taking a bath in a puddle or something. That's what birds do. All that is survival. But see, with humans, we get very sophisticated and fancy with our survival such that then we forget that it's even survival. We somehow think that the stuff that we do is so advanced that it's beyond survival, when really it's just a more evolved, complex form of survival. 
And what you see all throughout the animal kingdom, and, and of course up through humans, including humans, is that the more evolved and complex the life form is, the more sophisticated its survival strategies become. So, you know, if you take a little worm, it doesn't have super advanced survival strategies, but you take a snake, it has more advanced ones. And then you take a, uh, a chimp, it has more advanced ones. And you take humans, and of course, we take it to, uh, to a whole new level. But don't let all that complexity um, obfuscate what's really going on, because what's really going on is rather simple. You're just surviving yourself. Also understand, though, that just because an organism's survival strategy is complex and elaborate and full of deception, that that organism is conscious of what it's doing. It's not. And these are two very different things. Most humans have elaborate, sophisticated, highly intelligent survival strategies, but they're unconscious of them. They don't even realize that that's what they're doing. And that's a very important distinction to make because sometimes people make uh, this misconception. They say, well, but, but Leo, I'm good at survival. As though like being good at survival means you're conscious of your survival strategies. That's not the case. For example, Donald Trump is very good at survival. He's been surviving his whole life by hook or by crook, you know, scheming and manipulating every sort of way. But that does not mean he has a clue as to what he's doing and why he's doing it. He's doing it all on autopilot. See, that's very different. Those, those two are, are, are very different things. So it's not enough for you just to become good at survival. What we're talking about here is what's even more important, which is you becoming conscious of how and why you're doing survival. These days, notice that it's, it's, it's very easy to take survival for granted because society outsources and hides survival. The complexity, sophistication, brutality of survival is obfuscated and justified and rationalized with complex social systems such that most human beings don't even understand what goes into their survival. Like you think you just go to a grocery store and just pick up some bananas or some meat and that's how you fulfill your basic food needs but you don't understand the sophisticated logistical chains that these grocery stores have developed in order to provide you with these bananas and this meat at the cost that it's being provided at, the inspections that go in to this, the imports and exports, the tariffs, the various political systems and orders that need to be erected and also toppled in order to get you these bananas that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get from halfway around the world, the shipping uh, logistical chains, you know, they have to be shipped by, by, by sea and by truck. And like, it's, it's extremely complicated, see, but none of that is, is seen by most human beings. And so it's easily taken for granted. And in a sense, this becomes very dangerous because it disconnects us from our survival. Like if you were just living by yourself in the rainforest or in Alaska somewhere, you, you would be connected with your survival functions because you'd have to actually like go fish for some fish hunt for some squirrels or for some rabbits or whatever. You'd have to maybe grow your own vegetables, build your own cabin. And so in this sense, your survival would be very kind of simple, straightforward, and honest. But in modern society, our survival becomes very convoluted and uh, filled with all sorts of uh, deceptions and ploys and facades and fake fronts. Ah, my nose is itching today. Um, and so you got to be, you got to be clear eyed enough to see through that, you see, especially like within business, business obfuscates survival so much. Most people, they just go to a job, they work there doing some sort of grindy secretary work or whatever, and then they get a paycheck at the end of the month, but they have no idea how they fit into the entire machine that that business is and what that business is actually doing. Maybe you're a secretary for some giant, uh, military industrial complex company like Lockheed Martin or something, and you have no idea that actually the work you're doing is leading to uh, the bombing of civilians halfway around the world, you see? And so this makes us irresponsible about how we survive. And in this way, a lot of devilry and quote unquote evil can arise because uh, everything is so compartmentalized and siloed that you don't ever see the big picture of what you're really doing when you're working for that company.
that's problematic. Another thing I want to point out, which I mentioned in part one, but I didn't, I don't think I, I stressed it enough. <laughs> I want you to really start to appreciate how intelligent survival is. It's unbelievably intelligent. Like it's, it's brilliant beyond comprehension. Your survival or even the survival strategies of, of simple animals. It's incredibly intelligent. Like it's unbelievably intelligent. But just because it's intelligent does not mean that the animal is conscious of it. The intelligence is sort of just a force of the universe. It's the intelligence of evolution, which we'll talk about another time. But now let's move on. So here's a key insight for you about survival. The more central that an object is to your survival, the more emotional and upset you will become if it's threatened. So just consider a couple of different categories of thing. Your children, your parents, your pets. Think about how upset or emotional you get if one of them is threatened versus if your car or your house or your bank account is threatened versus something rather small like if a towel that you use is damaged or you get a flat tire or you lose a shoe. So these, see, see, these, are, these are three categories of, of centrality of these objects to your life. You will react very differently to losing a child than to losing a shoe. Why is that? Well, it's because of how central the child is to your entire survival strategy. So, of course, you get much more emotional about your children, your pets, and your parents than you do about lost shoes. Because the more energy you invest in a thing, the more you need to defend it. Because it's central to your survival. And like I said in part one, we tell ourselves all sorts of elaborate, um, fantastical stories about why something is so important to us or why we're so emotional about it or so upset about it without admitting to ourselves the true reason. So like if you ask a parent, well, why do you really care about your child? What, what's wrong if, if the child gets kidnapped? Well, you know, the parent will, will come up with all sorts of flowery stories. But the bottom line is that it's central to the parent's survival. It's because the parent has invested so much energy into that child. That's really why. It's not out of love because your love for your children is not unconditional. Parents' love for their children is extremely conditional. So that's a lie. See, what we do is we tell ourselves these flowery stories about how the stuff we do in our lives, we're doing for the good of mankind or we do, we're doing it for the good of our children or out of love and all this other sort of stuff. Uh, when in reality, a lot of times, uh, this is just bullshit you tell yourself. Bullshit that society helps you to tell yourself because society has already pre-made stories and narratives about why you do the things you do. See, we've concocted these together to make our human actions look much more noble and selfless than they actually are. And then we wonder how come our life isn't working? Well, maybe it's because you're living your life so selfishly. But then you say, oh, no, but I'm very selfless. You tell yourself that you're selfless, but are you actually selfless? See, so we got to be uh, brutally honest with ourselves here. Another key insight, just because a survival strategy fails does not mean that it's not a survival strategy. This is important. People get hung up on this. For example, going to the grocery store is a survival strategy, and it still is a survival strategy, even if I go to the store and accidentally buy some spoiled lettuce and get poisoned and die from it. That was still my survival strategy. I just happened to be unlucky in this case. I chose my lettuce poorly and, um, and then I died. Yeah, that, that happens a lot. Survival strategies fail frequently. Or for example, robbing a bank is still a survival strategy even if, even if I get killed in the process. Now, you might say, but Leo, didn't you just say that survival strategies are highly intelligent? But what's intelligent about robbing a bank? It seems like any fool should understand that robbing a bank would, uh, would be a terrible idea because it would endanger one's life. So how come this person is doing it out of survival? Well, there are many degrees of survival strategies, and there are many degrees of intelligence to survival strategies. Even the stupid ones that we would 
called the so-called stupid ones are still rather intelligent. You know, a lot of intelligence gets put into robbing a bank, even if you don't succeed. Still requires a lot of intelligence to do that uh, and to execute that. Uh, but of course, there are many self-destructive survival strategies. There are both short-term survival strategies and long-term survival strategies. And a lot of times when someone is in a sort of a needy state, a very fearful state, and they immediately need money or resources because they're in such a tight bind or they have mental issues or whatever, of course they can devise all sorts of unhealthy and toxic and self-destructive survival strategies. And we'll be talking a lot more about that as we keep going here. So that's extremely common. In fact, that's usually the case. It's usually the case that you get stuck with some survival strategy, which is actually dysfunctional and counterproductive and is actually damaging you. But the problem is because you're unconscious, you're running the survival strategy on autopilot. And so therefore, even when it hurts you, you still stick with it. Because also understand that survival, remember, is not simply about uh, physically thriving. It's more about surviving whatever you were. So for example, for a bank robber, like a criminal, a criminal is a certain state of mind. The criminal maintains that state of mind. To be a criminal mind, you have to keep doing criminal stuff. It's an addiction. It's hard to break that. So someone who's robbing a bank, he's probably been robbing cars before that and probably been robbing grocery stores before that and so on all the way back to his adolescence. You know, it had to start somewhere. So that that programming, that sort of way of looking at the world of like, how do I rob somebody? How do I exploit some system? That sort of way of looking at the world, that's, a, that's an entire worldview and that's very difficult to change. And it's that worldview that is truly being survived in the case of somebody robbing a bank. See, it's not merely just about getting a bunch of money and then having food to eat. It's a lot more complex than that because we humans, our survival goes way beyond simply putting food on our table and keeping the, the lights on. It's a lot about our, our personal identities. Remember that. Also, for example, smoking is still a survival strategy, even if it gives you cancer in the end and kills you. How is it a survival strategy? Well, consider how most people get into smoking. Usually they do it when they're uh, teens. And why do they do it? Well, usually because Smoking is something new, it's something hip, it's something cool. It's a way to, uh, to challenge authority, to challenge parents, to challenge teachers. So in school, if, you're, if your friends are, are smoking and you're the odd one out, you don't want to smoke, then see, that's, that's part of your survival agenda is you don't want to look weak in front of your friends. You want to look cool too. You want to be accepted. You want to be part of the group. So. Part of being human is being part of the group. So activities which make you part of the group automatically become important survival activities. So you guys listen to the same music and you talk about the same stuff and you wear the same clothes, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a bonding activity. And then maybe being cool helps you to get attention from the girls, helps you to get laid, whatever that might be. So that's all survival, social survival. And that's mostly what teenagers are struggling with during that part of their life is how do I survive not just as an individual, but within a collective amongst my friends and peers. Teens are, are learning how to do that. And of course they make many mistakes. And then once you are hooked on this, on the tobacco, then later in your life, it's a survival strategy to keep smoking because now you're physically addicted. Your brain has been changed and altered by the nicotine. And so now when you stop smoking, you get restless, you get stressed, uh, you have withdrawal symptoms, all of this. And so now, of course, it serves your survival because survive, a big part of survival is comfort, psychological comfort. So smoking that cigarette gives you that psychological comfort. Now, of course, you might say, well, but Leo, but you wouldn't even need that psychological comfort if you didn't start smoking in the first place. So it was stupid to start. Yes, of course. But the person wasn't looking that far ahead when they started. And now that they have become addicted to it. Well, now it's certainly a survival strategy to smoke a pack of cigarettes a day or whatever it is, even though it's wasting your money and it's ruining your health and it's ruining your teeth and all sorts of stuff. See, but then 
you actually, a smoker, a long-term smoker, will actually develop a certain kind of identity about being a smoker. And then they will actually bond with other smokers. And, you know, they'll see a smoker in the airport and they'll say, oh, yeah. And then, like, automatically there's a kind of automatic rapport that's built, even though these people never met before, just because they're two smokers. Uh, and so it becomes, it becomes a certain lifestyle and really a certain kind of identity. Likewise, depression is still a survival strategy, even if it leads to your suicide in the end. How can depression be a survival strategy? Well, uh, just think about it. What is depression really about? Depression is a certain s emotional state. This emotional state is actually a very important signal that your subconscious mind is creating based on the situation that you find yourself in. So, for example, maybe you're working in a nine-to-five job that is ruining your potential in life. You're just wasting your life there, and you're feeling miserable, and eventually you get become depressed. That's a signal from your subconscious mind telling you, hey, buddy, uh, <laughs> this is not the job for you. You need to move on to something else, something bigger. There's bigger stuff for you to do out there in the world. Uh, but maybe you're too scared to act on that. Maybe you're too lazy to go find a new job or to develop a new career from scratch. You know, it's hard. Uh, and, and so you just kind of stick with it and you say that, ah, it'll, it'll improve, it'll improve. I don't need to change anything. But it just gets worse and worse and worse. And you get more and more depressed until eventually maybe you kill yourself. So this was a survival strategy in the sense that you were surviving as that lazy self, that scared self that didn't want to go out there. Uh, also, the depression was a signal. You weren't listening to it. See, it was telling you to wake up and to do something new and to change, but you didn't listen to it. And then eventually it got you to where it got you. Also, it could be that you develop a certain identity about being depressed and you can turn that into a whole victim identity, getting attention from other people and so forth. And then that becomes your survival strategy. See? So, mm, it's very, very sophisticated especially your entire emotional system is very sophisticated in how it sends you signals that help you to navigate life. And you know, a lot of people, they are depressed, but they never kill themselves. What happens is that they're depressed for a few years or so forth. And then finally they admit to themselves that, okay, this is enough. I can't do this anymore. I got to go to a therapist or I got to stop drinking or I got to stop smoking or I got to stop whatever I'm doing that's contributing to this depression. And they do, they change their career. They maybe they quit a bad relationship, which was depressing them. And then their depression lifts. Most depression, of course, doesn't end in suicide. Uh, speaking of suicide, suicide bombers. Uh, that's, a, that's a survival strategy right there. Now you might wonder, but, but Leo, how? Seems like it's the opposite of that. Seems like it's destroying your whole case here for survival. But not at all. Because look, a suicide bomber... He's got very strong religious convictions and beliefs. He believe, believes in an afterlife. He believes in Allah. He believes in, in the importance of, uh, of defending his homeland against foreign invaders or whatever it might be, or against the corruption of the West, against the great Satan. Uh, so this guy who's doing the suicide bombing, he's got a very strong ego and a very strong self-image about being a loyal Muslim who's going to be a martyr and dying for the cause. And then he does so. And by doing that, he believes he's going to go to an afterlife and, uh, and all that good stuff. And that is what's being survived, not the physical body. The physical body is not what's primary. And actually, it's you who's judging this person for being foolish. You know, because in the West, we look at that and say, well, how stupid to think that there's an afterlife and, and that you're going to go to heaven for blowing yourself up. But actually... <laughs> Joke's on you, because what do you think happens to the suicide bomber after he dies? He becomes infinite. He becomes Allah. So he's not wrong about that. What he's deluded about is thinking that the suicide bombing is, a, is, a, <laughs> is, is, is somehow necessary and that hurting people is somehow necessary in order to reach Allah. That, of course, is, is not at all the case, and that's, that's uh, very self-destructive and uh, counterproductive. But, you know, uh, these survival strategies can be very, very twisted, is what I'm trying to say. Many of them are self-destructive. And that's precisely why we want to become more conscious of them 
because the survival strategies we pick up when we're young and from our culture and from our environment, they tend to generally be quite self-destructive. And that's because they're picked up unconsciously. They're programmed into us, either in school or in our church or by watching television or from our parents and friends or whatever it is. Here's another very important insight about survival, which is that there is no such thing as the one best survival strategy. There are millions of unique survival strategies because there are millions of unique selves. In fact, each human self on this planet, seven plus billion of them, has unique needs. Of course, we have a lot of common needs. We all need food and water and so forth. But then I'm talking about that ego self. What does your ego self need? That's unique for every individual. And what most people don't understand is that the survival strategy that works for them is not going to work for others. This is a common mistake that people make because they're so stuck in their perspective and they're so not conscious of their own survival and also survival in general, how it works. They think that, well, if, if being a Christian works for me, it must also work for the Muslim. And it must also work for the Jew. And it must also work for the primitive uh, tribal peoples living in the Amazon. So let me go and start a missionary work and doing missionary work and starting to spread the message of Christ because it's going to work for everybody. No, that's just your personal survival strategy. It's rather arbitrary and it only works within a certain context, in a certain environment, in a certain time in a certain culture, given certain geopolitical conditions. You see, there's no such thing as a survival strategy independent of one's environment. There needs to be a perfect match between what's going on in your environment and then your survival strategy. That's what survival amounts to. In the same way that there's no such thing as the one best animal in the animal kingdom, right? There's no best animal. It's always a question of, what environment is the animal living in and how well fitted or suited is the animal to that environment? So if we're talking about the Congo rainforest, a gorilla or a chimpanzee might be perfectly suited to that environment, maybe even better than a human. If we're talking about uh, uh, some Arctic Circle type of environment, then maybe penguins or polar bears are perfectly suited for that. And so you can't take a polar bear and put him in the Congo. It's not going to work. And you can't put a gorilla into the Arctic Circle. So a lot of the, what, the, the kind of very simple and obvious mistake, but most people don't understand this, that, that, peop, that humans have been making throughout history is we've been trying to push our own personal survival strategies onto others. Of course, your parents have been doing this to you since you were a kid and a teenager, which is why you rebelled against them. Um, uh, but also, your culture has been doing this to you, and your culture has been doing it to other cultures. So this is where we get the culture wars, and especially when you get stuff like, you know, um, when the West is trying to interfere with Middle Eastern affairs, for example, and then it all goes to shit. Why does it do that? Well, because it, because there's a clash between the environment and the culture that's already there and the survival strategies that you're trying to enforce upon them. You see, it's foreign. It doesn't work. It's like trying to stick a, a polar bear in the Congo. Of course, it's not going to work. You need to become cognizant of that. But you can only become cognizant of that if you're able to step outside your perspective and kind of like look at the big picture. And also, if you're able to respect other people's survival strategies and needs, recognize that people have unique needs. If you're a parent, understand that your children will have unique needs from you. Of course, they need food and water and the basics, but they have a different personality type. You might be artistic and they might be very mathematical or vice versa. You might be very masculine and your, your son might be more of a feminine type of guy. And you got to understand that. Otherwise, you're going to be trying to like force him to go to the gym and force him to do masculine stuff, but he doesn't want to do it. See, I mean, it's, it's very obvious, but people overlook the obvious. 
Also, what people overlook is that all of us are at different stages of development. This is where spiral dynamics comes in. This is why spiral dynamics is so good at helping us to solve various kinds of thorny, sticky political problems, social problems, is because spiral dynamics helps us to disaggregate, uh, de-lump <laughs> people from one group. Because before you learn spiral dynamics, you think of everybody as just being the same. After you learn spiral dynamics, you realize that no, people are stratified into different levels. And these different levels, they occur in, in a certain sequence. And so someone who's at stage red is not gonna resonate with stage green survival strategies and vice versa, see? And different people are at these different stages. So they need teachings and material and information and guidance, which will be suitable for the stage that they're at. And of course, spiral dynamics is all about understanding survival. Societies and cultures are playing the game of survival at different levels. Consider the survival that's happening within the United States, which is different from the survival that's happening within Scandinavia, different from Russia, different from Africa, different from the Middle East, different from the, the rainforest or living in a prison. These are all very different environments that require different survival strategies. And that explains all of the cultural diversity that you see around the world, all the major cultures and also all the subcultures. They are all different survival strategies. Ta-da! See? Even just look at something like the cuisine of every country in the world. Maybe you've seen some Anthony Bourdain or something like that, where you know the guy travels around the world showing you different cuisine, and you're looking at it, and it's so weird. You know, people eat such weird stuff in different parts of the world. They eat stuff you've never even heard of in certain parts of the world. They eat insects and they eat giraffes and rhinoceroses and who knows what else. You know, they eat all this weird alien stuff, um, and it's amazing. Kind of opens your perspective because you're so stuck to your cuisine. Like your cuisine is so limited if you're only thinking about American cuisine or European cuisine compared to all the possible cuisines out in the world. But why is this? Well, if you look into it, the cuisine always reflects the resources that are available within that culture. So, for example, um, parts of the world where there are plenty of insects that are edible, they eat insects. And in parts of the world where there are giraffes, they'll eat giraffes. So the reason we don't eat giraffes in the United States, they don't live here. See? Um, so it's all about working with like what you've got. Also, I want you to notice that survival has co-opted all social institutions, including the military, businesses, corporations, nonprofits, charities, Schools, universities, governments, think tanks, media, Hollywood, you name it. Every social institution is simply another level of survival. Because, you know, see, we, we humans are we're very social creatures. So we survive individually, but then we survive, survive collectively as well. And then our collectives become an extension of us. So this complicates survival even more. Uh, of, of course, you can see this within the animal kingdom too, like with ants. Individual ants care about their survival, but even more so, they care about the survival of their ant colony. And in fact, I have a whole episode called Collective Ego, where I talk about collective survival. It's one of my most, most important and uh, profound episodes, so go check that out. And it's because humans survive in a highly social way, that's what makes us so powerful as a species, politics becomes so central to human affairs. A lot of people dislike politics and they say, oh, politics is just, uh, I don't want to have anything to do with it. It's all bullshit. But yet it's central to survival. All of these social institutions are filled with politics. I'm not just talking about mainstream politics of the nation, that's obvious, but I'm also just talking about, you know, politics within your little corporation that you work in or politics within your nonprofit, politics within the military, politics within a sports team 
It's all there. The politics is there. Why is it there? That's how you do survival in a social environment. See, that's the equivalent of going and picking fruit off a tree. You know, a, a chimp will pick some bananas off a tree. Politics is the human equivalent of that. And of course, even chimps have politics within their chimp troops. Actually, quite sophisticated politics. You can read about it. I have a, I have a book on my book list, which is really good. It talks about chimp politics. And uh, actually, how remarkably it parallels human politics. It's quite scary. <laughs> we truly are <laughs> the, the, the third ape, as we're sometimes called. Uh, another key insight for you is because identity, the thing that's being survived, is a fantasy, ideas and beliefs become central to survival, not just objects and people or material goods. Defending your worldview is a huge part of survival as a human. People underestimate this because we generally, when we think of survival in a sort of a, a material, physicalistic sense of just like surviving your body, biological sense, then we tend to place too much importance on material objects and people. And you know, it's obvious that a car is a material object which significantly enhances a human's survival ability, extends it. But even more important than a car is a human being's worldview. Because a car is still just a very local thing. It's just an object. You can change it, you can replace it quite easily. People go through many cars in their lifetimes. But a worldview, this is actually imprinted into your mind from birth. This is very difficult to change. Almost impossible to change we're talking about just changing the entire thing. Your worldview is like your operating system, which governs how you interpret and understand everything that's going on around you. And of course, human beings, uh, we take in all these ideas and beliefs, and we're always interacting with other human beings through symbols, through language, through ideas, through concepts, through philosophy. This is very much all wedded to your worldview. How you interpret and think about the world, this affects everything. It's your operating system. And of course, the operating system is, is more foundational than any individual app that is installed on it. See? So for humans, defending their worldview becomes a huge part of survival. And in fact, you could battle someone to the death over a conflict of worldview. You would think like, well, that's so silly. Why would people kill each other over a worldview? But you're underestimating just how significant a worldview is. It's more significant than a car. Sometimes it's even more significant than a family member. You know? Some parents would rather disown their children than give up part of their worldview. That happens all the time around the world especially in, in many developing countries where their worldview tends to be quite dogmatic, spiral dynamics stage blue or lower. So for example, your idea of what a family is or is supposed to be, this is part of your worldview and is very central. Or your idea of gender, what gender is, or what a male or a female is and suppose, is supposed to be. This is central to how you define yourself as male or female. The idea of scientific materialism, your metaphysics, in other words, you believing that you're living inside of an objective external reality that science can measure in a factual manner, that's not relativistic. That's central to your entire understanding of your life. Your religion, your ethnicity, all of these are part of your worldview, and uh, they shape you very much. Why do people get upset by the idea that their identity, for example, is a fantasy? They get very upset by this. Because, of course, the whole point and premise of survival is that you need to create an identity, manufacture it, but then deny that you've manufactured it 
because you need to take it as reality. You need to take it seriously. So if you're conscious that you've manufactured your own identity, this is this just in and of itself is very threatening and problematic for many people. Because then, all of a sudden, if you admit that, then you have to kind of admit that your identity isn't real. And if my identity isn't real, well then, why bother protecting it or surviving it? And of course, the answer is, you're right. There's no reason to bother surviving it. But that doesn't help you to survive, does it? So, of course, this is what I meant earlier in part one, where I said that survival is not rational. It is its own end, survival. So in this sense, if you can come up with some fantasy and then defend that fantasy and actually buy into it so deeply that you believe it's reality, that literally becomes your reality and that's how you survive. Because if you didn't care being male or female or being a Muslim or a Christian, if you were just kind of willy-nilly about it, like one day you're a Muslim, the next day you're a Christian, the next day you're, you're something else, you're a Jew, like if this was your approach, isn't it funny how nobody takes this approach? Like, this is unheard of. Nobody does this. Why? Like, when I was younger, I used to think, like, why Why don't people just, like, spend a month being a Jew and another month being a Muslim and another one being a Christian? <laughs> well, it's because, of course, it's their identity. They're attached to it. It's precisely because they can't do this. Because if they did this, they would literally dissolve and die. As that. You can't be a Muslim and then next month become a Christian. Because in a certain sense, then, you weren't a Muslim to begin with. Because what it means to be a Muslim is that you're completely certain that Islam is true. And it's the best. And if you're, if you're going to open your mind even a little bit to doubting that, then you're going to very quickly stop being a Muslim. Or a Christian, or a Jew, or a Buddhist, or whatever you identify as. You see, so this is the core problem. This is why people get so ideological and dogmatic all the time about all things <laughs> uh, is because they create these identities out of out of it and then uh, that is what they're trying to survive and this is the chief obstacle to spiritual work because spiritual work reveals to you that all these identities are constructions but of course it's precisely because it's true that people are so threatened by it that they become hostile when you tell them this see people become very hostile when you tell them that physical reality isn't real why not? Because this calls into question everything. You're basically, mm, it's like pouring salt on a snail. You're going to dissolve their entire operating system and their entire sense of self. This is very painful and scary for people. So they react with hostility. They get very defensive. They start to project upon you. They start to act stupid. They, they go into denial and all sorts of other survival strategies are used in order to maintain their identity. They'll threaten you, they'll they'll try to burn you at the stake as a witch, or, you know, whatever they're going to do. They'll call you a liar. They'll send you threatening letters. This is what people do. What do you think the, like, the Spanish Inquisition was about? See? It was a bunch of Catholics who wanted to defend their Catholic identities. Not because it was true, but precisely because it was false. See, truth needs no defense. Your true identity as nothingness, it doesn't need any defense at all. What needs defending is, is all the fabricated identities. Christians, Jews, Muslims, atheists as well. Atheists is a fabric an atheist is a fabricated identity. A scientist is a fabricated identity. Don't think that just because you're a scientist or an atheist or a rationalist or a skeptic that somehow you're immune to, to these identities. Those are all identities. Secular identities are still identities. You can be some Fortune 500 CEO who doesn't believe in God and doesn't care about any science or anything. All you care about is just money and business. That's your identity. That's what you're defending. And so when someone comes and tells you that all of your money means nothing, you're going to get very defensive and threatened, and you're going to be very hostile about this. Of course, because it undermines your entire way of life. Why do people get hostile when you tell them that you are God or that they are God? Precisely because they've 
develop this belief in God, this dualistic, separate God, this sort of authority figure. And they have used God as an authority figure who sits and judges you and other people. And they use this to build a moral system. This moral system is their way of surviving. Because, see, they, they've grounded their moral system in the judgments of God, which means that it can't be questioned, so it's divine. It's God's divine judgment and, uh, and justice. And so that allows them, then, to judge the rest of the world because they say, no, I'm not judging. It's God who's judging, and I'm just obeying God's rules or God's uh, commandments or whatever. See? And then you tell them that, no, you're God. Or, I'm God. You tell them that, and they get... They get very flustered, they get very defensive about it and say, no, Leo, how dare you? God, I can't be God. You can't be God. This is blasphemy. Yeah, that's your survival strategy for defending that identity. And the reason that it triggers you or upsets you is precisely because it's false. Your identity is false and the truth is nothing. The truth is that you're God, but you're in denial about it. Why do people get hostile when you tell them that gender is a social construct, for example? Which it is. Because they don't want to admit that something like gender can be a social construct. That's scary. You're, you're going down a slippery slope there. See? That might get them to start to think and question their own identity. Maybe that'll open themselves up to secret homosexual uh, urges that they've had. See, they, they don't want to admit this stuff because their culture tells them it's wrong. They have part of their identity is that homosexuality is somehow deviant and wrong and somehow less than heterosexuality. See, it's a slippery slope because, you know, if, if we start to admit that gender is a social construct, that God and religion is a social construct, even, dare I say, science is a social construct, and law is a social construct, and government is a social construct, well, what's left? Is everything a social construct? Am I a social construct? Maybe you'll discover that you are, and then poof, goes your whole life. See? It's very threatening because you're attached to surviving as a physical entity, and maybe there isn't one. See that? Maybe there isn't one. So, of course, such people get upset and threatened. It's, it's only natural. That's their survival strategy. Their survival strategy in these cases is denial, judgment, criticism, hatred, violence, bigotry, closed-mindedness, criticism. I think I already mentioned that one. Yeah, so it's, it's all that projection. That's a huge one. It's all the self-deception mechanisms that I've talked about in my self-deception three-part series. Go check that out. Here's another key insight for you. You are totally oblivious to your survival and your selfishness. Because, oddly enough, it doesn't help your survival to be conscious of your survival strategy. Because becoming conscious of survival strategies, if they're low consciousness survival strategies, tends to interfere with them. In the same way that, for example, if you're working on Wall Street and you're making millions of dollars every year, by selling junky stocks to, to, to old people, let's say. Um, you're running some sort of hedge fund and you're, you're fleecing people and you're manipulating and you're exploiting, but you're earning millions of dollars doing it. Does it serve you to become conscious of all the, all the trickery and manipulation that you're using? Is it, does it serve you to, to see that everything you're doing is just automatic robotic survival strategy because you're fundamentally insecure within yourself and that you're you're greedy does it serve you to know this of course not because if you truly admitted this then you'd have to realize that i can't keep doing that you'd have to find higher consciousness survival strategies because it would be too painful and also you'd have to somehow admit to yourself that all the all the evil you've done in the past, that, that that was wrong, or that it was selfish, at least. And uh, so, of, so, of course, an entire culture on Wall Street is created to preempt 
becoming conscious of these survival strategies. So see, it's not enough that one person on Wall Street deludes himself about the kind of devilry that he commits every single day by working on Wall Street. That's not enough. There needs to be an entire culture. All the people on Wall Street, because they're in this together, need to get together and create an entire culture, a subculture really, uh, that justifies that what they're doing is actually necessary and for the good of the nation. And so that's what they do. Not just on Wall Street, but everywhere. In the military, in charity organizations, in the government, in the Republican Party, the Democratic Party. Um, every social institution justifies to itself why, why it's saving its own ass is actually good for, for everybody else because they want to paint themselves in the best light possible because that's what gives them the moral high ground. See, you want to take the moral high ground. So it's simply not in most people's interest to become conscious of their survival strategies. Consciousness makes blind selfishness untenable. That's the, that's the problem with consciousness. A lot of the unconscious stuff that you used to do, you can't do anymore once you're conscious. Consciousness comes with great responsibility. When you're really conscious, you can't steal from people anymore. You can't rape people anymore. You can't have slaves anymore. You can't fleece people through scams and con artistry. That's a problem for most people. See, because most people in the world are, are living in, 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 in such a desperate state that, that they need to do those things just to survive. See? So, in practice, high consciousness teachings become the enemy of the survival of the majority of people. Because most people are surviving in such a crude, low level of consciousness that just the existence of high consciousness teachings and high consciousness people threatens them. The very existence of it is threatening because it shows them that there's a higher possibility and that they're too afraid to pursue that possibility because they're too greedy or too fearful or too selfish or too hateful or too closed-minded. And of course, they need to deny that in order to stay that way. How does a closed-minded, greedy, bigoted person maintain that? by executing on, on the greediness, the fearfulness, and the closed-mindedness. Most people grossly underestimate how selfish they truly are because they're constantly bullshitting themselves about it. And also because they distract themselves. This is another key technique. See my episode, distraction, the ego's favorite defense mechanism. Most people distract themselves from their own selfishness by externalizing the problem and criticizing the selfishness of others and judging the selfishness of others. This is a classic technique. It's, of course, it's, it's projection. It's, it's a very tricky and sneaky technique because if I invest all of my time, for example, building a career, creating videos about how that person is wrong and this person is wrong and that person is evil, I can spend the rest of my life doing that and earn a lot of money doing that and that will be the perfect smokescreen to avoid looking inside at my own selfishness. And of course, from this results all the war and chaos and, um, and evil that we're accustomed to seeing in the world. Which leads us to perhaps the most important next insight of this uh, series, which is this. That what you call evil, let's put that in quotes, what you call evil is just somebody else's survival strategy. I really want you to understand this. Rape, slavery, theft, war, poison, murder, coups, violence, torture, assassination, exploitation, lying, manipulation, backstabbing, cheating, blackmail, prostitution, threats, plagiarism, scamming, con artistry, child abuse, selling drugs, human trafficking, corruption, brainwashing, propaganda, terrorism, kidnapping, genocide, abortion, cults, female genital mutilation, crucifixion, beheading homosexuals, stoning people to death, burning witches. What is all this? This is somebody's way of surviving. All of these are necessary 
for people to be who they are. Now, that doesn't mean we have to be that way in perpetuity all the way into the future. We can change. Humanity can change. And of course, individuals can change. I'm just saying that you got to see that all of these things, it's not just evil that somehow just happens or that it's caused by the devil. No, no, no. This is, this is all coming from everybody else being just as selfish as you and not being conscious of what they're doing and then justifying it to themselves as good, proper, and necessary. So the key insight here is that you have to stop judging other people's survival strategies. You have to go meta and understand that there's no one to blame for survival. When you're judging a rapist or a murderer or a warmonger or a Nazi, really what you're doing, it's as ridiculous as judging a crocodile for ambushing its prey or judging an octopus for changing its colors. They're just surviving. <laughs> and even more, here's an additional layer of mindfuck for you, is that your judging of these different survival strategies, which you call evil, that itself is how you are surviving. That's your survival strategy. You see, because you're demonizing survival by ignoring your own survival. Why would you judge certain survival strategies as being wrong, bad, or evil? Unless it was central to your survival to do so. That's exactly what morality is about. Morality is all about taking the moral high ground so that you can deny other people their favorite survival strategies by making them feel guilty about doing it. See? So it helps you, as the moralist that you think you are, to think that you're above rape and murder and theft and all these things, because then you can deny other people the legitimacy of doing so. And then what you can do is you can get some other authority figure. You could go tattletale on the rapist and you can say, look, that, that, that guy's a rapist. Look, he's, he's evil. Punish him for me. Imprison him for me. Execute him for me. Because he's a threat to me and to my family. Of course. That's the whole game that's being played with morality. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we should legalize rape. I'm just saying understand why this moral game is being played. I'm not here saying rape is good or that it's bad. I'm saying I'm just pointing out what it is. It's a survival strategy. And the reaction against rape is also a survival strategy. And your reaction against me saying this, if you're having a reaction, if you think that what I'm saying is wrong and is upsetting you, that is also your survival strategy. Otherwise, you wouldn't be upset. Why would you be upset about something that doesn't affect your survival? You wouldn't be. See, survival isn't bad. Survival is absolutely necessary. It's a precondition for all human life. So you, as the moralist that you are, put yourself into a very adversarial relationship with reality when you demonize other people's survival strategies. Because while you're demonizing that person over there for their survival strategy, you yourself are engaging in a survival strategy. Just the very fact that you're demonizing them is already a survival strategy. So see, when people judge Nazis or rapists or murderers or whatever, um, they think that, well, but Leo, but, but what's the problem? Like, I'm not a hypocrite because I'm not a rapist and I'm not a murderer and I'm not a Nazi. So there's no problem. Uh, that, that's true, maybe on the surface level. Of course, some people will actually judge a rapist and they themselves will be a rapist. So that's, that's a whole other level of hypocrisy and projection that uh, I'll assume that you're not in that situation. So let, let's give you the benefit of the doubt that you're not like that. Uh, but still, you have a hypocrisy problem. The fundamental hypocrisy problem you have is that all of these people 
at the big picture level are just engaging in survival. And so are you. And the reason that you're upset by all these people and their survival strategies is precisely because you're vulnerable and therefore you're going to use any means necessary to survive, including fabricating the worldview that what those people are doing is wrong and evil. And then telling yourself that you didn't fabricate it, but that it's objectively true and real and unquestionable. And that allows you to trick yourself and your community as well, because you're not just doing this alone, you're doing it as part of a community, allows you to trick everyone around you into a collective hallucination of morality, which then allows you then to, to take the moral high ground and then to dictate laws and governmental systems which stop those activities that you don't want, which then creates a society which is conducive to how you want to live. Now you might say, well, Leo, isn't that good? What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying it's survival and you're not conscious of how you're doing it. And also you're not conscious that it's a, a fantasy that you're creating. It's a hallucination. So your outrage, all of your moral outrage, what I'm telling you is that all of that is bullshit. Because in reality, there's nothing to be morally outraged about. It's just survival. Is the gazelle morally outraged that a lion chases it? No. Because the gazelle isn't sophisticated enough to be able to bullshit itself with complex conceptual moral systems. It just runs away. See, it doesn't demonize the lion. But if the gazelles could get together and create a worldview, what would they do? They would create a, a worldview where the lions were the most evil ones in the... <laughs> in the animal kingdom because that's what would serve their survival and that's exactly what humans do it's not good or bad it just is what humans do it's survival survival is not good or bad it's just survival what unites all of life it's that we're all selfish as fuck and what unites all humans is that we're all selfish as fuck and we're totally dishonest about it to ourselves. We don't admit it. But also, some of us are much more selfish than others. So let's not pretend that all of us are equally selfish. There are degrees of selfishness, and it is important to take these into account. The reason I'm telling you all this is because it's important, as part of your growth process and your maturity process, to appreciate the brutality of life and survival. It's a very brutal game. And it's important to integrate survival and spirituality. You can't hold these two things as separate. A lot of times people actually use spirituality as a sort of pseudo survival strategy. And what they do is they use spirituality to either attain a moral high ground or a spiritual ego that they can use to then judge people who uh, maybe haven't gotten as high in their development and evolution. Uh, but that then itself becomes survival. Because if you're truly doing spirituality properly, eventually spirituality will lead you to realize that the entire game of survival is a, is a charade, is a fantasy, and that it must be transcended. And ultimately, that's what you'll do if you follow spirituality to its ultimate conclusion. But of course, most people are not cool with this. Most people only want spirituality as an enhancement to their survival strategy, which is why we get religion. That's what religion is. Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Judaism, even Buddhism in certain cases, it's... For most people, to transcend survival is such a radical thing that they can't even open their mind to the possibility that religion or spirituality actually is leading them towards that. Instead, they co-opt spirituality as just an additional tool that they can use to help themselves to survive. That's why this work is so tricky. Because your ego is always going to want to co-opt these ideas. Even the stuff that I teach with Actualize.org, you've probably noticed that your ego 
constantly keeps co-opting the things that I say in order to actually build a sort of a spiritual self-actualization identity rather than actually transcending all of that. And so self-actualization becomes part of your survival strategy. Watch out for that. Notice that. It's a very tricky trap. Also, it's important at the same time to realize that all survival is actually done out of love. And this is what unifies selfishness and selflessness. Everything is made out of love. Every human action is done out of love. Even, even every animal action is ultimately done out of love. You know, why does, the, why does the lion chase the gazelle? Because he loves life as a lion. Because the lion loves his family, ultimately. And the only way he can maintain his family is by hunting down a gazelle. Why does the bank robber rob the bank? Out of love. Out of love of money or out of love of, of being a criminal or out of love for his family if he needs to provide for them. See? It's just different degrees of love. There can be very high degrees of love and kind of low consciousness degrees of love. So all the stuff that you call evil, that's a low consciousness degree of love. It's a very partial love. It's love only for a very limited self, whereas the higher versions of love are love for self as the entire universe, the universal self. So that's the only difference between uh, devils and saints. They're both doing it out of love, but the devil is doing it out of a very partial, limited, divided form of love, whereas the saint is doing it out of a universal form of love. And also, very importantly, the saint understands that the devil is doing it out of love. If you don't understand this point, then you can't really be a saint because the only way that the saint can truly love universally is by realizing that he is all the devils as well. And so the saint doesn't really fight the devils because the saint just realizes that they are me. And so really the saint loves the devils to death. You might say. This removes the duality between selfishness and selflessness. And always remember ultimately that the devil is God in disguise. All of it is one, all of it is God. So make sure that you don't hold survival as bad. And that's very tricky, that's very hard to do because all of your impulses, all of your survival impulses are pushing you towards seeing good and bad in the world. Good and bad, that distinction is itself a core survival strategy. See? Only people who have transcended survival can lay down the label evil and bad because they literally don't see it in the world anymore. Because those labels are a part of survival. And so, so long as you're surviving and you're stuck within survival and you haven't transcended it to anything higher, then you're going to have to keep using that label of bad and evil. You can't help it. You're stuck on autopilot. That's what survival is. You know what evil is, really? Evil is anything that hinders your survival. That's what you call evil. And this explains why evil is relative and not any kind of absolute or objective fact, and why everybody has a different idea of what constitutes evil. Oftentimes, the reverse. Like, you know, in the Middle East, they might say that America is evil, and in America, we might say that the Middle East, uh, portions of the Middle East are evil. Who's right? It is however it looks to you. It's a perspectival, relativistic matter, precisely because... Evil just means that it's against my survival. So, from the United States' point of view, um, parts of the Middle East are evil because it hinders American survival, and vice versa. Nobody's right or wrong because it's just a difference of survival needs, difference of perspective. But of course, 
people don't even want to admit this because just to admit this already now places a big burden upon you because now you need to actually consider the other side. You need to consider other perspectives. You see, so multi-perspectivalism in and of itself is a dangerous notion for most human beings to allow into their worldview, which is why multi-perspectivalism is so rare. It's a great burden and responsibility to take on, to actually consider other people, other people's perspectives as though they were as important as your own. This is antithetical to what the ego and the self wants. The self wants to only consider its own perspective on things. You see? Notice that playing victim is a big survival strategy. People love to play victim. Notice that within politics, Notice it within relationships, in intimate relationships, or if you have a conflict within your family, what happens? Usually it's a game of one upsmanship as to who is the biggest victim or who was wronged first. Or for example, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What does that conflict ultimately boil down to? The Israelis claim that they're the biggest victim and the Palestinians claim that they're the biggest victim. Who's right? <laughs> Same thing happens in your intimate relationships. When there's an argument between you and your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend, you try to claim that you've been victimized by them and they try to claim that, you no, 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 you, you victimized me first. You said this thing to me and that's why you're a bad person and that's why you did me wrong. And you say, no, 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 no. But before I said that, you said this other thing and you said it first, so actually you're the wrong one. And so I'm actually the victim and I have the moral high ground. You see, it's very twisted and counterintuitive because you would think like in a debate, what people would want to argue over is who's the strongest one, right? They'd want to prove their strength. But actually in these conflicts, usually it's people are trying to prove that they're the weak one. So it's like, I was victimized. I'm the weak one. I deserve sympathy. I deserve redress and retribution and, and justice. And you don't because you're the aggressor. You see, which is why every war that every nation has ever waged, um, they have accused the aggressor. The aggressor has accused the other side of being the aggressor. See? So like when the United States goes and invades Iraq, we call Iraq the aggressor. They force us to do it. See how it works? This is devilry in action. This is how the human mind works, both individually and collectively. Start to notice this. Also start to notice that if you did not care about survival, nothing would be evil to you. Which of course is precisely God's perspective. Because God is nothingness, because God is infinite, God is immortal, it can't be harmed. You can't harm reality. And so, to it, nothing is evil. Or, to put it another way, everything is love. When you realize there's no evil, then everything becomes love. But you as a selfish ego who's busy surviving, as this organism that you think you are, you can't see infinite love. Because the stuff that's going to kill you, you can't hold it as love. Because you're you, and you've placed you above love. So really the choice is, you can have yourself or you can have love, but you can't have both. So which are you going to choose? The denial that evil is relative is itself a survival function. How do you defeat evil? By going meta and by transcending survival, by realizing that all evil is actually done out of love. And of course, this is one of the most counterintuitive moves that you can make. And people, uh, people are so scared of this notion because they're so attached to survival. They can't see outside of themselves and their survival agenda that it doesn't even occur to most people in their entire lifetime. They can live for 80 years and it never occurs to them that uh, 
that the way to defeat evil is through love. Most people try to defeat evil by doing more evil. They think that by judging evil, this will stop evil. And actually, this just creates more evil, which explains why there's so much evil in the world. It's very counterintuitive to stop evil. Most people who try to stop evil actually create more evil. So watch out about that. You know, because if it did, it, you'd figure if it wasn't this way, we would have stopped evil thousands of years ago. You know, why, why would evil continue for thousands and thousands of years, all the way into the 21st century? Only if it was extremely counterintuitive and nobody could stomach doing it. That's the only way evil can persist, and that's exactly how it works. Another key insight for you. Survival is absolutely relentless. The ego is absolutely relentless. So you might wonder, like, Leo, why is life so hard? Why all this suffering? Why all this self-deception? Why are people so evil? And why is awakening so hard? It's simply because you're attached to survival. And that drive is so utterly relentless that you know nothing else. You can't help being evil. You can't help being the devil that you are. See, it's, it's relentless. This is not a, a moral condemnation of you. I'm not saying that you're a devil and therefore you're bad. It's just ignorance. You're just acting out of ignorance and unconsciousness. And so therefore, you're not morally responsible for this. You're not bad at all. You're just an ignorant devil. If you knew better, if you were more conscious, you'd stop doing it. But you don't know how to do that. Unless you do, in which case you're not a devil or you're less of a devil than you would have been. Another key insight for you is that survival is so important that you, the ego, cannot be trusted with it. So most of your survival functions are automatic. Precisely because it's too important to entrust to your conscious mind. So it's relegated to your subconscious mind. So for example, your heartbeat. You know, that's absolutely important. If your heart stops beating for even a minute, you're going to be dead. So of course, that means we can't leave it up to your conscious mind. It's all done automatically for you. Likewise, most of your emotions work this way. You're not conscious of how you get angry or fearful or why you get excited or horny or why you get lonely or depressed. You're not conscious of any of these emotions. They're acting you. They're playing you. This is how the body gets done. What needs to be done is by playing you. You're not playing it. It's playing you like a piano with these emotional keys and chords that it strikes every day to get you to do what it needs to do. And the stuff that's relegated to your conscious mind, to your ego, is some important stuff, but a lot of it is not that important. The most important stuff is, is too important to leave to you. Because if you, if you had a say about whether you get horny or not, or whether you react with pain or not to getting, you know, stabbed in the foot or something like that, uh, you'd be dead long ago. You wouldn't be here listening to this. You'd be dead already. See, this, this stuff has to be relentless, absolutely relentless. And this is precisely what creates that sense of reality, of physical reality. A lot of people mistake pain and suffering for reality. And they think, well, Leo, if it's painful, it must be real. <laughs> no, that's actually precisely how the illusion of reality gets created, is we create a, a knee-jerk automatic reaction from you against pain and suffering, which prevents you from ever questioning it. The less conscious you are, the less you understand your own survival strategies. Therefore, unconscious people behave like devils. They are obliviously selfish, shamelessly selfish. And of course, the final twist that they put on it, the, the ultimate devilish irony, is that they think that they are angels. They think that they're saving the world. You know? Hitler thought he was saving the world from his perspective. In his eyes, he was an angel saving the world against devils. That's precisely how a devil sees himself, of course.
unconscious survival strategies, as I said before, are often short term. But I didn't say also that they were mostly, uh, they're, they're often unsustainable and unecological because it actually takes a lot of awareness and consciousness to have ecological, sustainable survival strategies. Therefore, a lot of survival strategies, which are short term and very kind of opportunistic, they end up backfiring in catastrophic ways. And the reason this happens is ultimately because these short term survival strategies, when they come from pure selfishness, lacking a larger perspective, they are fundamentally dualistic because there's that separation between self and other and environment. And so therefore, when you separate what is ultimately one, you stop seeing the holistic interconnections between you, others, and the environment, and therefore you end up shooting yourself in the foot. Because in the end, you cannot treat the world or other people as though they're separate from you. You can't, for example, just be a rich person and say, ah, to hell with the poor people. It doesn't matter. As long as I have my yacht and my private jet, and as long as I'm making a killing on Wall Street, then it doesn't matter what happens to those poor people. That's their problem. Because you see, if you, in the short term, that works. In the short term, that works. But in the long run, it doesn't work because eventually the people become so poor and so desperate that they rise up, they grab their pitchforks, and they come for you in your mansion. They, they bust down your private gate, and then they, they, ro they roast you on a spit. And they confiscate your private jet and your yacht and everything else. See? So, um, it only works for so long. Likewise, you can't just be like a, uh, some oil executive which says that, oh, well, as long as I'm making my millions and billions selling oil, uh, fuck global warming, fuck the earth, it doesn't matter because I can just like live in my own little bubble. I can build a, I can have so much money, I can just build an underwater city and live there. And I don't care if, if the global temperature rises a couple of degrees centigrade or if the ice caps melt, I don't care. I'll have enough money to, to just buy some nice property on some mountaintop or whatever. That works in the short term, but it doesn't work in the long term. See? Because you yourself are going to suffer. Because, you know, maybe you're an oil executive, but you still, for example, enjoy going to the coral reefs in Australia. And maybe you enjoy going to Alaska and seeing some polar bears. Because, you know, you... You like wildlife. People, most people like wildlife. Um, uh, and, and maybe, uh, maybe your children, for example, like the rainforest. And uh, maybe, maybe your daughter becomes like a marine biologist or something. Um, and somebody else in your family, you know, isn't as rich as you. So they live in a city like Los Angeles where the smog and the pollution just like, you know, keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And eventually they get asthma or some sort of cancer of the lungs. Uh, and then they die. And then it affects you. Even if you're living in your bubble, it's still going to affect you. Because in the end, the whole point of spirituality is to realize you can't live in a bubble. You can't separate yourself from the world. You're part of it. You're the whole of it. It, even if you do manage to separate yourself in some underwater bubble and live there all by yourself with no friends and no family and nobody else because you're all alone and you're all self-sufficient and you've got your billions of dollars. Well, realize, first of all, the economy could collapse, which would destroy all your billions of dollars. But also, in the end, even if you have everything you want and you're sitting on a, a mountain of gold bars <laughs> or <laughs> crypto coins or something, uh, in the end, you're going to be sitting in that bubble all alone, disconnected from the world, you're going to be um, spiritually bankrupt, loveless, disappointed, lonely, disconnected from mankind and from your environment. And you'll probably kill yourself. Or at the very least, you'll live a, a miserable life full of suffering. And you'll miss out on the greatest joy of life, which is to realize the interconnectedness of it all and to work towards towards that truth rather than to work towards devilry, which is fragmentation. See? But it takes a lot of consciousness 
and fearlessness and selflessness to realize some of these ideas that I'm presenting here. Then your survival strategy starts to change. So the problem with selfishness is not simply that it hurts others, but that because self and other are ultimately one, it hurts yourself. So ultimately, the devil ends up shooting himself in the foot. And it's by awakening to that mechanic that the devil realizes that, oh, yeah, my devilry, it's not going to work in the long run. It only works in the short term. And it's not satisfying even for me. So why keep it up? And that is the beginning of true spiritual growth and the beginning of, uh, of a possibility of transcending survival. It might seem that unchecked selfishness is the best possible strategy for surviving, but this is not true because life is non-linear and life is counterintuitive and there are twists and turns and things fold back on themselves. So often, unchecked selfishness works quite well in simple scenarios. But as the environment and the system becomes more complex, the selfishness becomes too counterproductive. This is why, for example, Trump's America First policy is so foolish. From Trump's point of view and his level of consciousness and the consciousness level of his followers, it seems like it's a smart strategy because by America just being more selfish, it's like, yeah, well, we're not giving anything to the rest of the world. We're just going to sort of like be by ourselves and do what we want and flex our muscle and put us first. And that's going to get us the most. That's going to get us more jobs and all this other stuff. But this is a, a misdiagnosing of, of the, the problem because our world truly is global and it is only going to become more and more interconnected. And so this policy of putting your nation first this nationalistic policy is a dead end. It can't possibly work. And the further society advances and the more complex it becomes, the more integrated everything becomes, the advantages of the integration are so huge that to then go back to a policy of putting yourself first is going to be extremely counterproductive. And in the end, it's going to lead to a net loss. And so, see, if Trump was a, a systemic thinker, he would understand this. But of course, he's not a systemic thinker. People sometimes argue with me and say, oh, Leo, but, but Trump is a brilliant systems thinker because he can manipulate systems. No, no, no. Systems thinking is not about manipulating systems. I'll give you that. Trump is brilliant at manipulating systems, but that is not systems thinking. Systems thinking is about working towards the benefit of the whole system because one recognizes that everything is interconnected and that you are not separate from anybody else. That's the, that's the true meaning of systems thinking. And of course, Trump is, is nowhere near that, nor are most of his followers. They don't understand this because they're, they're not cognitively developed or consciously developed enough to see the interconnectedness of, of all things. They think they can get away with just being devils. And of course, that's what they're trying to do, uh, but it's not going to work. <laughs> it's, it's obviously not working already, and uh, it'll only get worse the more you try to push it in that direction. This is the problem with nationalism. As human society evolves to greater complexity, unchecked selfishness will work less and less. This is a very clear trend that you can see throughout history, if you're a student of history. You know, like for example, tyranny and monarchy are no longer sustainable forms of government almost anywhere on the earth anymore. Whereas they were just 500 years ago. Why is that? Because the world has become more interconnected. And so there's less and less tolerance of tyranny and monarchy. Uh, there's more respect for individual rights. There's more respect for this idea that we're all part of a community and that you can't just execute people because they have a different religion than you. Whereas 500 years ago, that was totally normal. It was totally normal. In fact, it was expected that you execute people who have a different religion than you because 
they're, thre- they're a threat. They're undermining your sense of identity. But now our identities have expanded such that we no longer, most of us, I hope at least, no longer feel threatened if somebody next door, our neighbor, is a different religion than us or is an atheist or is a homosexual. We don't feel a need to kill them because we're more secure, because our identity is now more global. A lot of it has to do simply with the media. The movies you watch shapes how you form your identity. And the movies you watch are are so international now that it's untenable for a person to be born in the 21st century and to to really have a, a hatred and fear of Jews or Christians or Muslims or atheists or homosexuals or whatever. It just like, it's a non-issue. But 100 years ago, it was a huge issue. On the other hand, though, we also have to say that being totally selfless also doesn't work because you die too easily. So part of your job in life is to figure out the right balance between selfishness and selflessness. There is no formula for this. It's different for everybody. Because people are different and people live in very different environments. In some environments, like if if you're living in a prison or you're living in some ghetto where there are a bunch of gangs running around, you can't adopt the same kind of hippie, lovey, dovey strategy that you can adopt when you're living in some stage green or stage turquoise spiritual ashram. Like, (laughs) very different environments, you see. Let me also underscore that survival comes in degrees, like I said. Not all survival is the same, so we got to be careful here. we got to make fine distinctions. Some degree of survival is always required. Some survival is harmonious. Some survival is pathological. This is not a judgment, right? See, I'm not making a moral judgment. This is important when I say that some survival is pathological. Rather, we're looking at how well does our survival strategy allow us to live in harmony with others and with our environment. If it doesn't, then it's pathological. Literally, it's a cancer. So some survival strategies are cancers that eat themselves alive, destroy themselves. So part of growing up and maturing as an individual, but also as societies and governments, as humans, is for us to find healthier and healthier survival strategies. We can't all just escape survival like that. It's a gradual inching up process. It's a bootstrapping process that has been happening since the very dawn of human civilization, right? We've been refining our survival strategies to be more holistic and harmonious. And not always have we succeeded. In fact, right now we're sort of at a, at a precipice where our survival strategies are very unharmonious, threaten the entire planet. In, in a multitude of ways. So by finding these healthier survival strategies, you grow, you become more conscious, and you become more happy. You become more peaceful. Extreme survival strategies equal excessive selfishness, which equals unconsciousness, which equals corruption, which leads to chaos and uh, a lot of upheaval, which of course threatens life because life requires order and a certain degree of stability. As a community, we need to reach a consensus about which survival strategies are healthy and acceptable. This is not avoidable. So don't make the mistake of thinking that what I'm advocating for here is anarchy or no government, not at all. We just need to be very conscious about how we do government. Now, here's another key insight for you. Survival is tail chasing. All survival ultimately cannot win. All survival ultimately fails. It's just a question of how long will it work. 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, 100 years. But it's going to fail. 
every organism dies, every organization ultimately dies or changes or evolves to the point where it's no longer recognizable. Survival is fundamentally unsatisfying because it always ends in failure. So wouldn't it be nice if we could transcend survival somehow? Why can't survival ever, ever be won? Because, because to do so would require freezing all of reality. That's literally what it would mean to win at survival. It means that you could rearrange matter in such a way that you can create a, a fixed, static corner of the universe where it doesn't change anymore. But if you did that, that would cripple the infinite diversity and beauty and goodness of the entire creation, which is never going to be allowed under the grand design. Because the grand ultimate design is to maximize diversity, beauty, and goodness. To maximize perspective. To maximize diversity. Therefore, you cannot gain a permanent monopoly over reality. Because as soon as that happened, the flow and motion and creativity of reality would, would be destroyed. And this would produce for a lesser reality. And reality is designed in such a way that it maximizes goodness through diversity. Because ultimately all reality is one. One part of reality can never gain a monopoly or total power all over all the other parts of reality. Which is why ultimately all monopolies collapse. And all life must die. Because you see, if, for example, humans were able to make themselves immortal to never die, well, that means that by doing so, we would, in a sense, not allow other humans to be born. Because, you know, we, we can only have so many humans. So by, by this generation dying, we let a new generation come into being. So we kind of um, share the experience of life with others. But if we hoard it and we say, no, only I want to live, only this generation is going to live forever, fuck everybody else, fuck the future generations, then we're destroying future generations in that, in that way, you see? And this, this, actually, this actually lessens life. This ruins life. So life is, is meant to be cyclical and impermanent. That's a fundamental feature of reality is impermanence. Now, by this point, you're probably thinking, well, Leo, so what do we do about this? This sounds all very bleak. Is there anything we can do? Can we escape survival? Well, survival is inescapable so long as you want to live. Even an enlightened person must engage in survival. You notice? <laughs> enlightened people still have to shit, they have to eat, they have to drink. Despite what some of them might claim. They all do it. They all engage in survival. Now, their survival could be much more purified than an average person, but they still engage in survival. As long as they're in a body. You know, a body can only stay a body as long as it's engaging in survival. But there is a possibility to change your relationship to survival to gain some sense of freedom and relief. That is possible. It's possible to improve your survival significantly. That's possible. There's also the possibility of nirvana, moksha, liberation, being, and unconditional love, which we should talk about now. So in part one, I ask you to think about, as a bonus question, what isn't survival? So let me give you the answer now. It's tricky, because most of the stuff you do is survival. But a rock, for example, is not survival. A psychedelic experience is not survival. Non-dual consciousness or being is not survival. A meditative state of samadhi, of union, is not survival. Unconditional love, God's unconditional love, is not survival. Truth 
God itself, beauty, and the absolute, these are not survival. So, the best answer to this question of what's not survival is, is simply being. This requires that you actually have a, a shift in your state of consciousness out of the survival mode that you're constantly in, where your mind is projecting onto the world. And you actually look at an object for the first time in your life, and you see it as the being of the object rather than what the object is for you or what it means for you or how you're interpreting it. So, for example, you can sit there and look at your hand like this, just looking at your hand for a long time until you start to see your hand as being. Not as a hand. It's, it ceases being a hand. It ceases being an object, which doesn't mean that it changes shape or color. It still keeps its shape and color. The raw sensations per perhaps don't change so much, but your interpretations, the context within which you're putting this hand changes to the point where you look at this hand and you no longer even recognize it as a hand or an object anymore. It has no utility or function anymore. You don't care about what happens to it anymore. It doesn't matter if it gets destroyed or not. You don't think of it as your hand anymore. And literally, if you do this long enough, eventually you'll reach a state of samadhi where Actually, the separation between you as the, the onlooker, the subject, and the hand as an object, that will collapse. You will enter samadhi, and then all there will be is just like a hand floating. And for the first time, you will, you will look at the hand as what it actually is, pure being. So, of course, this is not unique to your hand. You can do it with any physical object. You can do it with the entire room that you're sitting in. You can do it with your physical body. You can do it with anything. You could do it with another person. Um, you can recognize the being of it by stripping it of all of your survival projections. See, the problem is, is that even when you look at a rock, for example, when most people look at a rock, that's still not truly an escape from survival. Because most people, when they look at a rock, in the back of their mind, their subconscious mind is doing all sorts of sneaky stuff. It's either putting value or meaning into the rock, or it's saying that the rock is meaningless and unimportant, or it's just calling it a rock, or it's putting that rock into some kind of context. Like, for example, you look at a rock and you might say, oh, well, that's a that's a such and such a rock from such and such a place, such and such a time. You know, you're putting it into a context. All of that is still part of your survival. But to look at that rock and not even see a rock there anymore, that would be you breaking through the veil of survival into being. And of course, this is what meditation is about. This is what you experience when you do psychedelics. Psychedelics put you into that samadhi state of pure being, and it's just this magical state of where you look around the room for the first time in your life and you realize the magic of being. And it strikes you as pure truth and beauty and God. And uh, that's right. That's what it is. And, and, and that's a very sharp contrast to your ordinary state of consciousness where you're in survival mode. Where your mind is constantly thinking ahead about what you need to do, what you need to say in order to survive the next day or the next minute or the next hour. Now, it's, it's a little tricky. For example, I wouldn't say that meditation itself is not survival, because actually most people who meditate, they're meditating out of survival. And even the pursuit of enlightenment itself, I wouldn't say that it's not survival, because most people are doing it out of survival. They're doing it because they're suffering and they want to escape suffering, or they're doing it because their ego has some notion that they're going to find the truth or the ego wants to co-opt that enlightenment for itself and, and turn it into an identity, that's still all survival. But, you know, um, we're not perfect. We got to start with where we're at. So it's perfectly fine, for example, to pursue enlightenment or to do meditation for egoic and survival purposes at first. I mean, you got to start where you're at. 
you can't just become a saint overnight. So it's fine. You know, most people start to meditate because of very selfish reasons, like um, it helps them to relax, helps to quiet the monkey mind, which drives them crazy. It helps to maybe relieve some, some stress or some pain. That's all fine. Uh, likewise with psychedelics, you know, a lot of people take psychedelics for very selfish survival reasons. For example, they take a psychedelic because they want to escape their depression or uh, they're bored even. You know, boredom is survival. So, you know, you're just bored, so you take a psychedelic. Okay, fine. But see, it doesn't matter how you get there. Once you get to being, once you get to samadhi, whether it's through meditation, psychedelic, or, or whatever else, once you're there, you're there. It doesn't matter how you got there. Now you're in pure being. Now you're out of survival for the time being. The problem is that these samadhis and these psychedelic experiences usually don't last very long. And then you come back and you're back into survival. And then you see, oh man, now I got to deal with all this survival nonsense again. And you see just how stressful it is. You see how it robs you of your joy and beauty. Um, and you feel disconnected from God when you're back into survival mode. And that's exactly correct. And that's why these states are so important for you to experience. It's so important to have a few of these mystical experiences, whether through psychedelics or meditation or a Vipassana retreat or whatever, because at least then you have some new reference point of something beyond survival. And you realize that survival is actually a small aspect of a much larger thing that's going on here. And that can help you to then refine your life, refine your survival strategies so that they become less selfish, more universal, more ecological. This creates a better society, improves your life, reduces your suffering until maybe eventually at some point you might reach some uh, very deep level of awakening. But even if you do, as long as you still want to be alive here as a human, you're still going to have to maintain some semblance of survival. You can't just completely ignore survival unless, like, literally you're, you're prepared to die. So that's just uh, how, how it seems to work. The quality of your life defense depends directly on how much you've transcended your survival. The wisest people are the ones who go as directly as possible to transcending their survival. But this is, this is pretty rare. Usually people aren't this wise. Here's another key insight. Survival has no meaning, value, or purpose in the ultimate sense. How could it? Because the whole thing was predicated upon a fantasy to begin with. There is and never was a reason that you should survive. Survival only appears valuable if you buy into it. But of course, there's no reason why you should buy into it. You buy into it irrationally. But at the same time, if you didn't buy into it, then you wouldn't be here thinking about it. And I wouldn't be here talking about it. So in a sense, survival becomes its own end point meaning and purpose. In this way, survival is tautological. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It justifies itself. It's selfish. It invents itself. Which is, of course, how it must be. Because how else could anything exist? If everything is one, it has to invent itself. It has to fabricate itself. It has to pull itself up by its bootstraps. It must be a strange loop. And that's what it is. The ultimate truth is that survival is an absurd farce and that you have an infinite number of lives and that actually you can't really die. What you truly are, your true identity of nothingness, can't die. It's immortal. But so long as form exists 
and it wants to keep existing, it has to struggle to maintain itself. Liberation comes by breaking this relentless cycle of survival, by breaking your attachment to life and to maintaining yourself as any kind of form, which means you have to recognize that your true nature is formless and that all forms are okay. You can occupy the human form for a while. Nothing wrong with it, nothing bad about it. It's just that recognize that there are certain costs that come to maintaining this form. A certain impact you need to have on your environment. You can't do it isolated from your environment. And also recognize that your form will end, so don't get too attached to it. And it's going to end rather soon, a lot sooner than you expect. So don't get too attached to it. The more attached you are to it, the more of a devil you will be in trying to maintain it. And if you really want to end suffering and be ultimately happy, free yourself from this whole burden and escape the entire cycle. Not by destroying your form, but by realizing that you, you never were the form. You were the formless the whole time. You've mistaken yourself for the form. Survival is the greatest obstacle to truth. Survival necessarily corrupts perception and reasoning. Because perception and reasoning are central to one's ability to survive. So it must be corrupted and co-opted. Which is why most human beings are actually incapable of doing good science or proper reasoning because they don't realize that their mind has been co-opted by survival. What keeps you from awakening is your attachment to all your survival strategies. And changing your survival strategies is hard by design because survival tends to be conservative. It tends to maintain homeostasis. because every survival strategy must work in the real world. It has to actually stand the test of reality. You can't just concoct some survival strategy in your own mind and then it's going to work. It needs to be brutally tested against reality, which is what evolution and natural selection does. You might object and wonder here, but, but Leo, you said that many survival strategies are fantasies. And now it seems like you're saying that survival strategies have to actually work in the real world. So then they're not fantasies? Which is it? It's a little tricky. Survival strategies are fantasies for most humans. But see, there's an additional wrinkle. Because we're a collective of social creatures, this allows us a very unique thing. It allows us to create a collective fantasy, which then becomes our reality. So, for example, a bunch of humans can get together and create the fantasy of money. We can agree that these green paper notes somehow have some sort of worth or value. And if we all agree on it, even though it's all a fantasy, as long as we agree that it's real, and we act like it's real, it becomes real. And it becomes very effective as a survival strategy because it allows us to now trade very easily in a way that wouldn't be possible if we were having to trade cows and houses and other things. See? So, you can't just come up with any random fantasy. Your fantasy has to be good enough to convince others that it's real. And that's actually not that easy to do. You would think that, well, Leo, so, so anyone can just sit and come up with all sorts of horse shit and then manipulate society that way. Uh, not quite. The, the horse shit that you spin has to work within the entire already spun web of horseshit that humanity has been spinning for the last 5,000 years or so, right? So it has to fit with that. And so in that sense, the horseshit becomes its own reality. 
you see? Like, Christianity has become its own reality. Islam has become its own reality. Science has become its own reality. And so now, if you want to be a scientist, you have to work within the fiction of science. If you want to be a Muslim, you have to work within the fiction of Islam, and so forth. So just because a lot of these things are socially constructed does not mean that they're not significant or serious. They're very serious. And sometimes you do have to conform yourself to them if you want to survive. That's precisely the point. Is that they shape survival so much. For example, if you get too out of line with your culture, a mob might arise and, you know, come for you with pitchforks. So in that sense, what the mob believes becomes real because they will ultimately grab their pitchforks and come for you. And that's going to be real. You're going to feel that <laughs> when they're poking you with those pitchforks. All right, so in wrapping this up, let's uh, give you your homework assignment. I want you to compare the survival strategies of your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your friends, and even your cat and your dog, and of course yourself. Hopefully you've studied your own survival strategy by this point. Keep studying that, of course, because you're, you're nowhere near done with that project. But, uh, but also, I want you to compare, especially within your own household. Because, see, now I want you to notice the differences. I want you to notice how survival is very relative and contextual uh, and different for everybody. So even though if you're all living in the same household like your family, uh, you're literally in the same environment. But still, you have very different survival strategies, for example, your mom, your dad versus yourself or your, your brother or sister or your cat. So notice that and study that. Notice what annoys your cat, what annoys your dog, what needs does your mom have that your dad doesn't have and vice versa. Don't judge them, just observe. A lot of observing and compare that with yourself. And then notice how that creates a lot of conflict within the family, all of that. That's where all your conflict comes from. Where else? Why would there be conflict if not for differences in survival strategy? And then if you want, you can broaden that out to an exploration of, of your, your company or your political party or your government or whatever. I also want you to study uh, the survival strategies, not just of humans, but also animals. And for this, nature documentaries are really good. Look at the survival strategy between a lion and a gazelle, between a mosquito and a bird, how differently they survive. Between a fennec fox and a jerboa. Uh, I mentioned these specifically because I'm going to post a video on my blog. Go check out my blog. You'll see a video there, uh, a really great documentary, like a short one, of the fennec fox hunting the jerboa in the desert. It's an amazingly shot uh, little documentary. Check it out and just take a look at how every part of the fox and every part of the jerboa are perfectly designed to work in that specific environment. It couldn't work anywhere else. It couldn't work in the rainforest. It couldn't work in the Arctic. It works in that particular desert. It wouldn't even work in all deserts, just that particular desert, like the, the hairs on the feet of the jerboa, the nose the whiskers on the fox and the ears that it has and all of this and how it all fits together, the eyesight at night and all of this and how it all fits together and how one runs away, the other one chases it and this is, this is survival. But then I want you to see that you are that jerboa hopping through your life and the environment you're surviving in is not a desert but uh, 21st century America or Europe or India or wherever you live. Your culture is the milieu in which you're trying to survive. If a thing is alive at all, it must have a sophisticated survival strategy which fits perfectly with its environment because if it didn't, it'd be dead. And in humans, compare survival in different parts of the world. For this, documentaries can also be really good. Maybe watch some Vice documentaries of how different people live. There are some great ones out there. For example, compare the survival strategy of someone living in New York City 
versus on a farm in Alabama. Very different. And of course, it's not just what they do for work. It's how they educate their kids. It's their worldview. It's their religion. It's their culture. It's their values. It's their ethics. It's their morals. It's their political beliefs. It's all of that. Or compare survival at a corporate headquarters or Wall Street versus survival in a prison or in a gang or in the Middle East. Compare survival in Africa versus Scandinavia versus Alaska. I posted some videos in the past, a long time ago, on my blog about this um, great reality TV show about survival in Alaska. I think it was called Life Below Zero, if I'm not mistaken. Great, great show, which shows you just how different survival is in Alaska. It, it follows a group of individuals who live all by themselves in Alaska and just kind of like live off the wildlife, live in the middle of nowhere, off the grid. And it's just amazing to watch because it just shows you how disconnected most of us are living in big cities from, from our survival. So just start to start to look at all this and put it all together, put all the pieces together, and you're gonna see you're gonna see what all of this life and self-actualization and spirituality is all about. And that's what I love the most is, is kind of seeing the big picture by putting all the little pieces together. And I've told you from the very beginning that one of my biggest objectives with actualize.org is to, to help you to see the big picture in a way that few other channels or teachers do. Very few people do this because it takes a lot of laying of groundwork, you know, putting out hundreds of videos to ultimately be able to put all the pieces together. Uh, and it's only then that you get to really appreciate the, the sophistication and beauty and intelligence of life by putting all these pieces together. You notice just how amazing it is, how it all fits together so intelligently, how well designed all of it is. It's, it's, um, it's remarkable. And that, that's what makes me so excited about this work is seeing these big pictures. And that's why we go into such depth and also so much breadth covering various kinds of topics because ultimately now, as Actualize.org is sort of starting to reach uh, a sort of pinnacle, uh, we're interconnecting a lot of topics. And it's really the payoff now comes, if you've been watching my videos for years, the payoff now is finally starting to to come to fruition because now we're starting to interconnect all the stuff we talked about. God and quantum mechanics and strange loops and uh, collective ego and spiral dynamics and whatever else I've talked about. So many different topics, you know. Now we're starting to piece them together and we get to see the really big picture emerge. But you can only get that if you put in the work of actually watching all this stuff diligently and keeping it in the back of your mind and thinking about it, doing the exercises, following up with the homework and watching the videos and examples and documentaries and so forth, and then piecing it all together. This is a, this is a multi-year long project, but I hope that you get to see the fruits of that for yourself. So in conclusion, rewatch this two-part series on survival again, later this year, next year, keep rewatching it because there's there's still, I guarantee, a lot of stuff about survival that you've uh, you've overlooked because you really need to study it for yourself closely to, to start to appreciate all the stuff that I put in these two episodes. Become an expert on how survival works. And that's it for today. Please click that like button for me and come check out actualize.org. That's my website. You'll find my blog where I'm posting new insights and ideas and videos and documentaries and bonus material. You'll find the forum. You'll find the book list. You'll find the life purpose course. I recently updated the book list with amazing life-changing books, rare stuff that you're not going to hear or find anywhere else. So be sure to check that out. That update is free for those who've bought the book in the pa uh, book list in the past. Uh, I've updated the book list eight times now, I think, for free for those of you who bought it originally. And of course, if you buy it now, then you get all those updates automatically. And the last thing that I'll say is you must do the observation work to be able to follow actualize.org. 
you're not going to understand the advanced stuff that I'm talking about unless you do the homework. That's the cost. It's not enough to treat this as entertainment the way you do with other videos. This is serious stuff we're doing here. This is not a joke. We are developing the most sophisticated and advanced understanding of humanity and life and reality that has ever been accomplished in human history. That's what we're doing. That's a grand statement, but that's what we're doing. And it's different than Buddhism and Hinduism and other traditions. It's way bigger than that, way broader than that. We're seeing a much bigger picture than you will see through Buddhism. I guarantee you that. It's different. What we're doing here is new and different. This is cutting edge stuff. Don't think that it'll come easily. Don't think that your friends and family will support you in this. It will be emotionally difficult. It requires investment from you. That's precisely why it hasn't been done before. <laughs> this is not easy stuff to do. This takes up my whole life doing this, you see. Um, but it's worth it. It's worth it. So start doing the work. Start actually observing. Don't speculate. Don't theorize. Don't disagree with me. Don't. It, it doesn't matter about all that. Do the observation work. The observation work will reveal what's true to you. You don't need to believe me. The observation work will demonstrate to you what's the case. All that I'm doing is I'm I'm presenting the conclusions of various kinds of observation work that I've done. And of course, various kinds of theory that I've studied and triangulated various conclusions from. I'm just presenting that to you, not as an ideology that you need to believe, but as something for you to pursue and to realize for yourself. And if I make any mistakes, which I of course can make mistakes, I'm not infallible, then it's through the observation work that you'll discover my mistakes. And then you'll correct those. Not through leaving me stupid critical comments and trolling and all this. This, this doesn't help. Do the observation work. And of course you don't want to. I know you don't want to. I struggle with it too. You're going to procrastinate. You're going to be lazy. You're going to come up with all sorts of excuses. Of course. Of course you will. Because if you fully understand all the stuff that I talk about, it's going to it's going to be the end of you. But luckily, there will be a new you. You will be reborn. Rise out of the ashes like the phoenix, as they say. But of course, you're going to resist that in the meantime. So, you know, struggle with it. Push yourself. Get out of your comfort zone. Make yourself uncomfortable. And also, just be patient. Be patient with this whole process. It's going to come together for you. I promise you. We're slowly putting the pieces together. This is a hobby. This is a, a, a long-term hobby that you're doing here. You know, some people like to collect bottle caps. Some people like to collect coins. Um, I like to collect concepts, the deepest concepts about life. And I like to piece them together and see life from higher vantage points that, than other people have ever seen it from before. And I like to look at it from different vantage points, from different perspectives, because there's not just one. And uh, that's my hobby. And so I'm sharing that hobby with you. And I'm trying to infect you with my passion for that hobby. And in that process, not only will you understand more of yourself and the world and humanity, but you will hopefully also ultimately end up liberating yourself. And that's what's going to make it all worth it.